operations. So this is a list of operational element that I, I as as an investment entity, right? Um, so for example, the custodian. So I, I, I was in the process of, of looking into uh, some of the criteria that I'm going to look at all the custodians, and I stopped for a reason. I'll explain that in a minute. You have a criteria bit go in terms of location, because that's important for jurisdiction. Because you're a fund, you have to be registered. You are a legal entity, and you have to follow all the regulatory elements of financial services. Transaction delay big important part. So when you process a transaction, if it takes two days, which is 48 hours, that can be a consideration in terms of liquidity and asset management type elements. Support digital assets, as you can say, there are 11 in some, like BitGo had 11 at the time, which is limiting. Uh, Coinbase um, has a bit more, and percentage stored off exchange. This was a risk model for us. So Coinbase had 100%, and, um, and then looked into security management technology, uh, hardware management console, MPC, multi-sig, physical security. So while as a fund admin and fund people, you may not care about this stuff, but these are things that you would have to consider given, oh, well, that's been erased, given all the things that we talked about in terms of technical element uh, of, of this. Asset servicing, tax reporting, security and asset reporting, fund servicing. So I think the question that I was asked on earlier in terms of comparison of firms. This is that list. You have all these players who provide some function. Question for you all, what's a custody provider? Do, I, we discussed this earlier. That's right, they, they, they provide non-custodial services because they, you're not custodying, they provide safeguarding of asset. What's a market maker? It's liquidity provider, <coughs> provide liquidity in the system. Uh, spot liquidity, Shreyas, can you enlighten us with that? Spot liquidity. Please call me Nitin. Instant exchange. Instant exchange, right. Uh, brokerage, that's right. You're a broker, which is non-existent term, like usually DEXs and, and ex central sex Xs are, are brokers, but there's no traditional broker, even though you have Gemini and Galaxies who are performing function of a brokerage but they're not exactly brokerage. Lending is, as the name suggests, lending. But it's not as simple, right? Because what does it mean by lending? Two is you have lending protocols. Aave is lending protocol. You lend your tokens to a protocol and you borrow against it. But in many cases you have, like I have an investment in a Bitwise token in Fidelity. And I got a note to say, get this, this is the funniest part, that you know you can lend, so you have securities lending practice. So for example, hedge funds, for shorting, you can't short what you don't have, so they borrow it from the market at favorable terms. So if IBM, somebody wants to, the hedge fund wants to short IBM stocks, they take IBM stocks and they short it. And in case they make money, they return the asset back. In case they lose the money, they buy it from open market and that's the loss they, they do. That's the sort of the model they do. So in crypto space, I was asked to do the security lending for Bitwise, which is a fund of the top 20 asset classes in the system. I said, yeah, I'm interested in lending my asset because at the end of the day, it's low risk. All you're doing is lending it and you're getting a, a percent return and all is good. Uh, except that they sent me uh, 35 pages uh, to sign and fax, uh, giving them the consent for, me, for them to use my asset. Can you see the irony in this situation? That you're dealing with the digital ecosystem where I can l lend my security or my token to a protocol with a click and now I have to download 35 pages, sign it, and fax it, or even mail it to them. And I said, man, this is the deal breaker for me. <laughs> as much as I want to make money, no, not just trust, but it's a paper trail. I don't know where the paper's gonna go. And second thing is, I'm a digital guy. I would want them to figure this out digitally. Why should I have to go and, who has the kind of time to print all those 35 pages and figure out where you want to sign and read all that stuff, you know? So, so that's lending. Derivatives. Yeah. Uh, clearing and settlement and execution. My question is, why do we consider these things for funds? So you know, we <laughs> you had the you had the fund.
you have advisor admin and and management but right. sort of a sort of three swim lanes and they do their own little thing they get their own sort of fees in the structure why do these entities have to worry about these characteristics and in traditional sense it makes sense but i would like you to think in terms of challenges with digital assets so look i'm we're not reinventing the market structure it exists it's been happening for 30 plus years so i'm not going to ask you what is a clearing settlement function what i would like you to think in your mind is as i have this check boxes and and those things to me it's a selection criteria and when i'm doing this i'm realizing as i pick my partners do i put all my eggs in one basket or do i find the best of breed solution which gives me a better ecosystem but in that case i have to have a much more robust communication mechanism so i can execute these trades in the, in in the right way and have the scale have the volume and second thing is how do i address things like clearing and settlement when i'm doing things like stablecoin because i'm not exactly tying to my banking system if i don't want to do that will i have a ability to flex my muscle in the digital realm that we have been talking about in the past two days that's the question we should be asking and as you can see a lot of red axes is an opportunity for us for you all in the space yeah, that those red axes indicate the fact that i have backed and i have worked with backed they do custody the there is settlement uh, so ha have you heard of backed by the way have you heard of backed no 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 not bad <laughs> backed b a I, i like the i like the enthusiasm though I, i love it and i know i had some i, I was supposed to talk the bat uh, i was supposed to talk about bat token in this session for some reason they said you know about three these three tokens and i didn't understand why they want me to talk about the token is there a relation to that like why was i asked to talk about bat token in this i just realized that since you mentioned it yeah but why was i asked to speak about speak about bat did you ask did you ask for that okay do you all know what bat is okay can you explain to us because then i'll i'll be done the check box here So you're getting paid for your attention, which is again the whole sense of ownership economy is you own that data and you choose to monetize that data on that ecosystem around it. Thank you, Shreyas. Uh, for some reason, asked me to. I just learned. I just realized that I'm supposed to talk about it till you mentioned BAT, and I was looking at more as BAT, B A K K T. First one here. Yeah. So it is a project, enterprise project between Microsoft, E N Y, back in the day, and ICE, which is the company behind my, uh, behind New York Stock Exchange. it's an independent company now and and they are trying to uh, it, just imagine this whole element how many of you are actually gen z in this room like super young people man who's who's proud gen z so how proud are you of being a gen z huh very so tell me more as to how would you this is great uh tell me more about how you envision the future payment infrastructure so i'm going to tell you a story tell me if that resonates with you um so for example like my son doesn't believe in banks uh, and he's like he's 17 so i don't know what whatever your age is so this guy so we look into this and saying what does the future of payment look like so he has a synthetic security let's say a dollar worth of tesla stock he would have a normal payment instrument of dollar us dollar he would have a stable coin in his ecosystem he would have a ethereum and bitcoin and some nfts because he's a gamer He has all this in his wallet. He goes to buy coffee, uh, and he says, "You know what? I don't like Tesla today, so I'm going to use Tesla to buy coffee." That scenario, basically using all these things of value you have interchangeably, which means that you don't want to have a brokerage account 
with the investment firm and figure out how do you liquidate that. You don't want to have just payment instrument or crypto and you it gets too complicated. So like I want to have one wallet, I want to use for whatever the hell I want to use these assets for because they all have something of value. But behind the scenes, the company should enable the swim lanes infrastructure for you that if you're using Tesla stock to buy coffee, converting a security into a payment instrument and paying for it in cash and handling all the complexity behind the scenes is what is the expectation from your generation. Does that resonate with you? Oh boy, you're in India, and that's going to be very hard. <laughs> so, Jay, I'm not really in the attention span. Like, we want to just do things that we think about it. We believe, like how you see, how you see the Tesla stock. So, we just want to like, have an idea in our head. No, I don't think I'll be able to put it across my mind right now. No, no, go for it. Go for it. It's okay. Articulate it. You're, if you're a proud Gen Z, you've got, to, you've got to hold an honor. Come on. You're representing your whole, your whole generation in this classroom. <laughs> Dude, the Gen Z, they're synced up. What are you talking about? <laughs> they're doing this download in real time. <laughs> Oh my God, you disappoint me as a Gen Z. <laughs> but that's okay. But that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you basically want to, um, no, no, I think that makes sense. And your banking comment, let's table it, because I want, I want to do that too, because that's a very sort of four generation out conversation. But it's okay, because the thing is that that's a perspective. Yeah, so my perspective is that uh, I, I, I'm of the opinion that you need some kind of central structure to put everything in place. And like when there are so many decision makers, daily things happen. Scale, like that, that scale so fast. Yeah. So back right to your point, uh, what's your name again? Oh my God. <laughs> you need to just I'm sorry. using a bank, using a travel agent. Maybe he's just doing this as a Gen Z experiment, like we are cool too. Maybe sort of appeal to my to his granddad to say, Hey, I'm doing the same thing you were doing back in the day. I'm just joking. I, I, I tried Yeah, yeah, they do. Central structures do make things easier. Obviously, big banks have, cannot change themselves, but the newer, bank, the newer versions of yeah. banks that are coming, they would be better placed to deal with all these things. Like, if there are so many decision makers, decisions can't be taken that fast. Yeah. That's great. Please go ahead. <coughs> Yeah, I know. So it's a long way process. Yeah, I spend, uh, so I, my ancestry goes to UP and we have, we still have villages, I still go, and as a part of payment research, I spend months in, in many of these places, including Uganda's villages and Indian, Indian villages have been going for a long time. So I completely understand that point of view that in many cases it's easy to just go to a bank and take a passbook and do these things because there's a digital penetration problem that while people may have cell phones, Right, and that's the question I actually raised to many of the international because they're looking at m like, look, India can do that too. 
I'm like, have you spent a day in a village in India to understand that uh, their bigger challenge is energy? So you still use Nokia feature phone because it charges up and they can use SMS for a week, which you can do with the smartphones. So if you go to many rural villages, there's still energy is a, an hour a day concern. So I, I, I see your point in that point of view. And that's why I think I had a con parallel conversation before this session is always people look at this and right now the crypto penetration is from the upwardly mobile, wealthy, middle class folks as opposed to reaching what is the intended purpose of reaching the fringes of society. But there's a hope in the sense that, so like backed, I've known them for a long time and that's what they're trying to do. So I have a back wallet and, that, and PayPal has done the same thing. They're hiding the element of custody of an asset and treating an asset in different asset classes, finding swim lanes, so obfuscating that complexity, <coughs> allowing you to spend any of these instruments to buy anything you want, as long as the point of sale system accepts this mechanism. That lies another problem, because point of sale system relies upon your traditional MasterCard, Visa, Amex, Rails. And so now the question is, because you all have smartphones, can the backed be a point of sale system, which is what Apple announced, as you know, to convert your phone into a point of sale system. So many of these sort of enabling tech, in my opinion, will fuel that agenda that you described uh, as an interchangeable assets that move in, that, in those rails to be able to perform an economic function of a medium of exchange, I, I think. So I think we've well on that path, and if you look at like BitGo, Bitfinex, these are companies, and I actually work with so none of them actually have all capabilities, which means that here's, and there are, it's a long list of, uh, it's a lot of research, a lot of time to know who offers what, and they all have different, which means six months later this will be different. None of them actually have all, and there are very well-established funded companies. So the question is, as I'm looking at fund admin, I have to not only look at things like custody, liquidity, ability for me to exchange, ability, these are all functions, which means that on a day-to-day -day basis, if I choose to buy and sell an asset, I cannot rely upon a two-day, which is a traditional financial market structure, for things to settle. So what, did, what do I do? I go towards a, a stablecoin option. Uh, I do need access with scale and connectivity to exchanges so I can provide function because I don't want to choose two days later because Bitcoin could go 15% down or up. So how do I deal with the volatility? Because volatility is, eats into some of the elements of, and volatility is also an opportunity. So I just want to show this to say, uh, these are the considerations from crypto investing and from other elements. And it's not as simple as going to coin D6 and, and just buying and selling it, which I think Shreyas, as you must, may have mentioned in your investment as an individual, you're probably doing that. But if you were to take that lens and apply that to a fund, because now you have fiduciary responsibilities, right? And you have to have a prudential treatment of your, of your customers' assets and investment thesis and everything else. You see how that suddenly becomes a complicated uh, element to start figuring this out because I don't think you can put all your eggs in one basket. You cannot just say, I'm just going to rely on CoinDCX or, or WazirX to do all my functions because now you're limited with their capabilities and it removes some of your flexibility of the intellectual sort of uh, arm that you want to flex, like we discussed early on, that I want to invest in Helium, so what do I do? So anybody in this room, if I have four assets that I, that's not custodied by that ecosystem that I described, what do I do? What are my options? From what you have learned in the past two, a, a day and a half. So you know we have asset classes. We described at length the research process, distilling assets, risk models, and we have chosen now a portfolio of 20 asset classes. I'm showing you this because now you know who custodies, who provide market making. So the idea is I can take the best of breed and have a complex ecosystem, which slows me down because I need to have multiple, multiple accounts, multiple connectivity, and have someone coordinated, which makes it complicated. Or I go to a prime brokerage and have them do all of it. What's the answer? There's no right or wrong answer, by the way. It's a topic for debate. Yeah. Yeah, most funds don't actually do active trading. So most funds, if you look at it, right, they're not like, uh, if you look at the top, the whole objective of fund, like actively manage or, or sorry, I'll take it back. The quant traded funds do that, right? They look at quantitative models and they basically have algorithmic trading, the high HFTs, they use that model. But most funds who are which have a defined thesis, they don't. So algo trading, absolutely, from that perspective. 
Okay, so I'm just going to switch to last deck on this. Any questions so far? Payments NFT X presentation. Okay, so let me go to this. Uh, I'm going to talk about the ecosystem now, uh, and and then we'll stop for the assignment and discuss as to what we discuss, and I have an open chat, uh, only because I think you can you'll have the decks, review it on your own time. It's all in easily understandable language, I hope. Uh, and if not, then you connect with me offline, and I'm happy to explain that to you. Uh, but I think it's important to understand not just where things are today, but also where things are heading, uh, as you will see. Come on, refresh. Yeah. So we're going to talk about when I say customer. So this is basically what we did. We prepared this for a detailed briefing for many of our clients. So these are the topics that we generally discuss. Uh, this was kicked out because it's just too long, and we had only ten hours. It looked into product and services, looked into digital asset types, which we discussed the previous section. But we've been discussing this for two days in terms of layers and everything else. And then we look into customer types, and customer types basically is the area that we look into. Who are the who are the ecosystem players in this case? So I think we discussed this early on in the spreadsheet that I had in towards the risk model framework. So when you look at risk, and we will not talk about this in detail, you need to consider these things. Reputation risk. Uh, there are many founders of crypto. Uh, how many of you heard of Quadriga? So Quadriga was a fund, crypto fund, or a, a blockchain project in Canada. The founder came to India and apparently he died, or he produced a death certificate. And um, then he had the keys to about $155 million worth of crypto assets. So now people who invest in that fund are wondering what happened to this guy, he suddenly moved away, and he died. And so that his wife produced the, the, uh, those. But then they found a transaction a month later with his keys. So that became a huge, so there was a CFO of that company who was running a fund. So when I talk about the qualitative elements of after doing all the data related work, who's the founder, that's what I mean by reputation risk. So if I find something who's shady or who has a checkered past, look, everybody has a lawsuit on them in, in, in crypto space, but some of them are valid, some of them are not. Uh, but if you have a fraud case, let's look into reputation. You have credit risk, operational risk. Operational risk is something we discussed just now. Who do you consider? Who are the players? What do you need to do? Uh, tech risk, compliance risk. This is basically all around digital assets, and each of them, by the way, has a detailed module that we cover. So it's a lot of lot to consume, lot to understand. Again, the idea is not to pack you with all the information in six hours. Just be inspired. Just understand that these are the elements that you should consider, whether you're doing it for enterprise, for yourself, this may be a little too much, you go with a gut feel, or you are building a portfolio, you need to build some of those elements. And so in many cases, uh, this is an important part of, of legal structure. Again, we'll not spend the time. DAOs are legal entities. Are DAOs legal? <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> it's true, they're not illegal. But are they, can they be a legal entity? So legal entity, for example, can do a few things because they're legal entities, right? Enter into a contract, Enter into contract help be held accountable, uh, contribute to political, because they're an uh, entity and they can exercise free speech, so to speak. Yes, so Wyoming has a legal entity. So get this ecosystem building, right? Uh, we work with Wyoming and uh, as a, entity that defines the reg and comp framework for them. And they had this uh, the, uh, SPDIs, special purpose deposit institutions. So they legalize the ability for you to create a bank, crypto bank, without the FDIC insurance, which frees up a lot of requirements from that perspective. And that basically is meant for crypto industry only. So which means I can go to Wyoming, use the SPDI license licensing framework, and open a bank. They also passed 
a element of legalizing DAO as a legal entity. So you can go and register a DAO as a legal entity and be able to create that legal structure. Now, have you heard of CityCoin or CityDAO? Have you heard of CityDAO? CityDAO. So CityDAO basically is trying to create virtual communities, virtual cities. So CityDAO registered with Wyoming, bought a piece of land in Wyoming, tokenized the fractions of it, and distributed the fractions to the owners of tokenized land. They bought a physical land. So now the, what, what do you do with it, right? So the question is, I have a token of the land. Well, I obviously can't go and sell the physical land. The physical land is owned by the DAO. I can trade this token secondary markets. But in future, the idea is the city DAO decides to, just like what Miami and New York has tried to do, is make investment in building communities or building some infrastructure of crypto assets. The profits from that will be distributed to the token holders at some point, which means that they have to raise more funds. And they have to have more investments in that ecosystem and they have to get more tokens, which means that initial investors have an early seed advantage to invest in a community, a dwelling or community that is still in the air, which is what we see in real, real estate too, right? That people invest in some areas and they over time develop and they have a massive property value. That's what's happening. So you have a legal structure. We have a state that built a legal framework. We have an entity that applied for a, a, a legal entity and not only in, in, in Wyoming, as a legal entity, they can own land anywhere in the world or anywhere in the country, in the US. Because they're a legal entity, because the state recognized them as a legal entity. So it's important to, to understand what is the legal arrangement. This is token, by the way, this is also a tokenomics uh, element is when you're giving a token, what does a token stand for? My voice is echoing. <laughs> I know. Just... Sorry, you were saying? Yeah. They took the land. They took the land and crashed the number of initial to DAO shareholders. Who? So uh, you can't put USD in DAO. You've got to put Ether. Source Ether. Convert the Ether into cash. Bought the land. Tokenized the land and gave it to all the DAO holders. So now DAO holders have something of value, which is some total and a fraction of some total of the existing or appreciated value. So tomorrow, should they want to build something, that's what we're figuring it out. What do you do? If I want to build a shop or build a resort in that piece of land. No. Because you know, it's, at the end of the day, it's still physicality of the land. You just can't say, this, this piece is mine. You can't build anything on this because I own this. But how will they come on a decision to vote to? Yeah, so anything that comes in, the entire community has to vote. And the governance process says that you need to have two thirds of approval of all token holders to do anything. So no longer a greedy, greedy developer can say, I'm going to go with you and not you. Everything has to be a proposal. Everything has to be approved by the token holders for whatever happens in the DAO, city DAO. Majority. Or two thirds, whatever the governance structure is. You pick, man. It's your poison for the assignment, right? No, no. Oh, I just, I guess it's oh OK. No, they bought, Constitution DAO went for an artifact. And create tokens, yes. They, want to have story. they actually wanted, they also wanted to donate it to a museum and, and have ownership and have sense of ownership around those things. Absolutely. So the question then becomes, if I want to build a resort, how do I go about doing that? So do I need to appeal to the 250, two thirds of majority to be able to open that structure? Or do I need to buy enough tokens in secondary market so now I have enough rights to Think about that probability, right? You can, both, right? you can do both. You can go both to say, I don't have the capital to go buy two thirds of those tokenized DAOs, so I'm going to appeal to the community with my proposal and how it benefits the community. So you're getting the best of breed, whether it's developers or whether it's a new project. And maybe instead of that, maybe there's a sustainability project that's on that land. So as a community member, I care about environment. Maybe that's one of the premise of City DAO, which means there's no way a water consuming resort will be approved. But there'll certainly be a solar pan solar resort or some sustainability sort of project that may be approved because the community cares about it. Yeah, yeah. So basically, you could either crowdsource it. So you are now. So my point is that no longer you have these big institutions that you have to go and plead for money. You have a much faster process. So 
Constitution DAO raised 42 million within a matter of an hour. Try getting a loan, especially the Gen Zs in this room, in an hour with that kind of money. So you have an avenue to appeal to this connected community that is financialized to be able to raise funds and do all these amazing things. I think that is the potential that we're really going after here. So legal structure, in some cases, do matter, especially with real estate and all these other areas, may not matter for a game. So if you have a dispute, then you have to figure that dispute out because you, know, you can't go to court and what's happening in Metaverse. One, they will not understand it. Two, there's no legal grounds for you to go and claim that guy took my sword from this game. I don't know what to do. Yeah, that's another good question. I think, so if you look at more statute in states, um, you define a director, yeah. operation member, everything else. And I think at that point, because you're tied to the entire DAO process, uh, the Wyoming statute just says that it'll be the community that'll be, that'll be, so anything that comes across, whether it's penalization, penalty, or cessation of existence, which means that if you want to build something, you still need permits from the government. <coughs> if you don't satisfy the requirement, the community has to figure things out, which means there has to be everything. Else. So it becomes a much more bureaucratic element inside of the DAO for interfacing with the government, but that may not be the case for decentraland, land, for example. So if I buy a plot of land in decentraland, land, that, that, may, that issue may not pop up because you're not, de so for example, there's environmental protection issues. So if you want to build something which is, which is affecting the sensitivity of that region from an EPA perspective, then good luck because that process takes six to eight months. No matter how fast decision making in DAO is, you're interfacing with the agencies and the physical world is still limited by that stuff. And you can't fix everything by, again, tokenizing or decentralization. You have to just coexist. So, really, I can think it's how it can be approved for some Yeah. Well, in many cases, I don't think like a serious crime, a heinous crime is like a murder or something. I don't think DAOs can commit murders or DAOs can, DAOs can be involved in white collar crimes, theft, um, misappropriation, uh, and none of them are exactly heinous crimes, like in terms of imprisonment and everything else, except that uh, they could, the, the worst thing you can do is cessation of that legal structure. You cease to exist. And which means that your token token becomes yeah. what? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Hold on, when you say hold on, hold on, contract killers. I said yes. I meant contract as in paper contract and cost killers. The con you mean contract killers and hitman? Boy, you guys are really motivated here, aren't you? <laughs> Just going all in. Like, let's, let's have a mafia on this thing, a decentralized structure. Let's buy ETH into it and start killing people. And the death certificate can execute the smart contract. Yeah, that's one way to get paid. Yeah. Does this guy die? You have an oracle that keeps listening for death certificate. All right, this happened. Let's just pay him for more ether. OK, I'll let you, I'll let you go with that. Uh, you have an assignment for sure. And you have an avenue to explore this possibility as a, as a potential business model in the assignment. And let's, uh, if you do go with this path, just put a disclaimer that this is only for intellectual exercise. We don't plan to go ahead with this because I'll let Master Union leave the legal ramifications. <laughs> I thought it says smart contract killers. I meant we have all these paper contracts. I thought, I was, yeah, yeah, of course, why not? You can. <laughs> then I realized for a minute, then he mentioned this Gen Z guy. Yeah, we can start killing people. That put two and two together, that's, that's amazing. Consent. Yeah, so I think two things. Right? One is there's a decision making in terms of consent, and the consent goes into the next step of the business process, like smart contract basically commits 
that into the which means decision has made. Uh, uh, the same thing with uh, Constitution Dow. Constitution Dow aspired to uh, to auction for a con U.S. Constitution. It didn't materialize, so they were unsuccessful in the premise of their own origination. So they had a choice: I'll return your money back, or we'll keep it in this pool for other projects. And a lot of people took the money out. But people I know who took the money out, they regretted it because they said, for us, just keeping the money, just like a first eight, 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 uh, eight pixel, eight pixel, eight, eight, eight bit pixel, you know, pixel, is costing them nine million bucks. Uh, they said we just wanted to keep our ETH in the DAO because that was first of a kind, and just keeping it in the DAO would give us a sense of pride. So, uh, in this case, I think. Um, they had a choice in terms of what happens, which means that if you don't believe in that system anymore, because everything is community driven, hence the meme, hence my social intelligence index, is the fact that you can leave the DAO if you don't believe in its core mission. So if I don't believe in that contract killing should be legalized sport, then I should be able to exit the DAO and let people who are interested in, in, in pursuing that business go pursue it. So uh, these are the customer type. These are the ecosystem players. We know what custodians are. We know exchanges are. What's an OTC trading in over, over the counter? But what is it in crypto world? Yeah. So that means that. So who are the other participants in over the, over the counter business? Yeah, because miners actually have the asset, right? They're mining it. So instead of going through a whole ecosystem that you can just plug them into OCD desk, and they can just send it through the OTC desk to the the demand and fulfill the demand that's coming from the individual invest investors. Repeat that again? No. Um, I see what you're saying. No, it just. I don't know what it is. It's unintentional. I don't care for the art. On that, we just went with the content, but that's a good observation. I'm glad you're paying attention. That's that's the positive side of the whole thing. Uh, investment funds. I discussed this pretty much half morning. Uh, lenders, uh, administrators, key management uh, is a big piece of this whole. So these are all the ecosystem evolving around crypto. And while some of them may seem and be like the existing models, they do have a different lens. So Fireblock as a custodian is different from Bank of New York Mellon which does the custody of securities. And they do custody, which means that they're not a financial institution, or they don't want to be a financial institution, though they have acquired uh, a firm which is a financial institution re you know, recently. They have acquired a stable coin company uh, from that perspective, but they're not. And so that's a key distinction in terms of, because you're not actually holding an asset, you're holding a claim to the asset, they have the ability to, so they don't view themselves as a financial institution uh, from that perspective. Uh, we have DAO, gambling and gaming, I don't intend to mix them both, but but they are separate. Uh, you know, ventures uh, are some of the biggest consumers of this. ATMs. Uh, interesting. Any comments on ATMs? Have you heard of crypto ATMs? Have you used any one of them? Yeah. And any thoughts? It's big. It's really big. And I didn't know this until I actually had to research for a call. As to where crypto ATM is, there's a, there was, used to be a company called a Kimchi Premium. Have you heard of Kimchi Premium? Anyone? So, so most countries have capital controls. Sorry, you had a question. Yeah, so because Kimchi is South Korean thing, and and basically Kimchi Premium was that you would have asset valued more in South Korea than any other part of the world because of the valuation of won, which is their currency, and their demand because they wanted to go into uh, I mean, we think Indian rupees are valued in too many zeros. If you look at Vietnamese dong, uh, it's in it's in much more zeros after you know aside it, and so Koreans are willing to pay more. So they would fly into and you have capital controls, so you can't take a million dollars and go convert into cryptos in many of these countries. In, India has a million per person per year. You can take million dollars out out of the country, which is pretty decent, pretty good. Uh, some countries don't have that. Like China is impossible to take money out of China maybe like 10, 30K or whatever, which is not a lot if you're an investment entity. So kimchi premium was the fact that Koreans would take 9,999 US dollars worth of Korean bonds, go into Hong Kong, use that current Bitcoin and keep making the trips 
and they were willing to pay a higher premium because they were trying to use it as a store of value. And so that's called kimchi premium because they would pay a higher fee for, so you would, so have you heard of the term arbitrage, which is, you, so that was used a lot in that, in that context. Of course, over time, efficient market hypothesis will say that things will balance out because there'll be, there'll be more, market will resolve itself. So ATMs are interesting because ATMs are meant just like Coinbase brought democratized crypto or Wazirx, everybody has an account and they can do it. Uh, ATMs made it easier for many of the entities to be able to simply convert their cash into tokens. And I've dealt with at least 30, 35 uh, different ATMs. And I, again, do experiments. My first ATM, believe it or not, can anyone guess which country? This is in 2015. Uruguay. Uruguay, of all places. Taxis were accepting Bitcoin 2015 in Uruguay. And I was like, how the hell is that even possible? Like, how do you do our infrastructure? Because all they did was they had wallets and you all, you had a wallet and you just put the ca cash and squares. Yeah, just scan your QR code, put the money and, and the transaction goes through and it says, and you have the, this is peer to peer, not even going through an exchange. I thought the same thing too, because why didn't the hell you need an ATM you didn't need a digital transaction? Apparently, there is a lot of pedestrian traffic in a lot of these places who would like to get into the space, and that's the market they're going after. There are like four. It's more like a, a marketing activity than. Like it is. Like when me in the US had this in all Walmarts, oh, we do crypto. And I went through the process. It's the worst process designed on this planet. I went and bought crypto. They, they check all. Then you want me to go to the website and then do all my KYC. Then I had to call somebody to say, hey, I, I'm like, which world do people live in? Like, you know, why you want me to sign a form, make a phone call? I'm like, this is just too antiquated a system. And I had just in the $10 experiment, like it's easy to let $10 go than spend like an hour and a half. And it took them three days because they weren't available then nine to five. They had nine to five. I'm like, this is just getting better and better. But on the marketing statement, they have. But to your point, in there are many countries, many economies that the crypto ATMs have done really, really well. Because you're cash heavy economies, it makes it easier. Like Bulgaria, I was in Bulgaria and I thought it was an easy way for people to just go and just uh, scan any excess cash, put in there and scan your. Of course, many of them have now been, been banned because one way to clean your money. No, it, it either means like a marketing activity or like a money laundering. Money laundering. Yeah. Yeah. But now you need to, like most of these, they will have to do KYC, all the ATMs. And so, and for that reason alone, the activity has dropped significantly because now you have to be known. The KYC element has takes away from the anonymity of this entire ecosystem. So I'm going to leave that. Customer types, um, we have talked about the hot wallet, call wallets. I will share all this with you. I think we've been discussing over time in terms of who these entities are. In preparation for this and some of the other, I reuse some of this content from the things I've been developing for you know, my conversations in terms of what are these elements required. So uh, you don't have to worry about this. This We talk to banks in terms of TRPM, third product, just management market abuse, fraud. You don't have to worry about this stuff for this class. This is really meant for regulated financial institutions that if they want to get into crypto, this is the landscape they have to deal with, which is enormously expensive. So I know we have short time. Assignment for next week, and then we have an open discussion. Is that good? Cool. Anything you want to cover? Any question you have? So what should we do for yesterday's assignment? Any question yesterday's assignment? That ship has sailed, my friend. <laughs> sure, your call. Uh, are you OK with that? They want to do a group of five instead of four. So yesterday, they wanted an extra week. Now they want to have extra people. So the assignment for, for the second assignment today is we dealt with crypto. So I want you to come up and don't use mine because someone took pictures. I would like you to first come up with a crypto investment thesis. Yes. NFT financialization is crypto. There is a whole ocean of 
financializing NFTs. So, which we haven't discussed in detail because it's a lot to unpack. So that's one angle. So you have to build an investment thesis. Okay, so I was thinking of keeping what we did yesterday and today related, but that would defeat the purpose. Also, page and a half or two max. So it's not a lot of work. More work should be on thinking. We spent a lot of time on crypto industry, players, actors. We talked about layers and investment thesis. So let's keep it two things separate. You don't have to present this. So you know we talked about for who brought this up yesterday, uh, the, the Gen Z guy. Yeah. So this one, you don't want to present the deck. This one, you can simply show, show, share the paper and talk about your stuff, only because for a fund, you don't have to raise money from a VC, but you have to attract investors. Now, if you want, as eager as you are, you can create a four-slide deck and pitch to me like you are raising money from me for your investment fund. I will let you all decide that. But the idea is to come up with a crypto investment thesis. This should drive everything else. So follow your conviction, find a sw small spot, a small corner for you. What do you believe in? So there are NFT guys in the room, there's a gaming guy in the room, um, you know, there's an in institutional person in the room, you figure out that whole thing, and then you find a supporting investment framework, exactly that sort of framework that we described. And again, follow your heart, you don't have to do that. Uh, so have an investment thesis, and that thesis says, because I have this thesis, I'm going to have this framework. And it can be a circle, it could be a triangle, it could be whatever your, your representation implies. Pick your, get creative with that. And then you have to create crafting a portfolio with distinction through the thesis. So if your thesis says, I'm going to do NFTs and it's great, and you have BTC and ETH, well, I will question that because that's not in alignment with your, with your thesis because the majority of the discussion we had today was around that fund. And the last thing is operationalization strategy. It's like you would do this if you were doing a fund anyway. So it's a practical exposure for you to know the four basic steps to craft a fund which should give you some insight as a part of this education curriculum to say, I need to look at these four things. Again, the idea is not to make you an expert fund manager, but the idea is to at least get you the theoretical element of what it takes to do this, and hopefully in the process, you will learn who are the entities who are operation, who are need to forget about operationalization, uh, operationalization, operation, operationalization, and uh, what do I need to adhere to my thesis that I have defined upfront, and which means you keep going back to what you define. So spend more. T I would spend more time in the thesis, and I think everything should follow. This will be purely, simply a material research that you may have to do in defining this. Question, Firoza. See, my handwriting is really bad. Crafting a portfolio with distinction to thesis. So which means that um, because you have a thesis, your, your entire thinking is in alignment with that thesis. And it could be anti-thesis too. What? Oh, sorry. OK. Any questions? Does it make sense? Or is it completely off, off base? So you have, you're getting two skills in these two exercises. One skill is what you all have asked me in the day one is, I want to learn about investment, investment, investment. Well, here's a chance. We spent all day doing this. Go and build this and, so, and, and solidify your thinking on that process. Yesterday exercise was around blockchain and around token economic systems. So I think those two exercises should give you a good feel, with the exception of few of you who have already gain some expertise in this space, give you a good feel of where things are. And hopefully you learn a thing or two in this, in the, in, in this exercise. So the objective is, and I don't know how to handle this, and you have to help me with this, um, is
time for me, <laughs> not for, for you. You have till next Friday. And now he wants five people. And then I, I'm glad I'm not coming back tomorrow. So can we do it three, month, three months later? And then I'm like, why don't I just pitch this to, uh, to, a, to a VC? But I don't know if we, you want to do this presentation at the same time. Should we do the presentation at the same time? The two, the two exercises, right? I'm asking your opinion. What do you guys think? Is it too much? No, forget about the modality of it. Is it too much to do both? Man, that's like. Forget the presentation. Forget the form factor. In fact, even if you present with just your two papers, I don't care. I mean, I don't want this to be a babu work. Just do whatever you want to do. And my point is, is it is it interesting or is it too much? You know, he's not representing you people well. You know, that's why we said the Gen Zs are lazy. That, that's the comment. I'm using a bank, I'm a travel agent. I can I do only one of those. <laughs> and he wanted to present yesterday. And he wanted to present yesterday. He brought it all. Look, you tell me, do we, or should I give you a choice, architect, to pick one of the two? Look, you're going to benefit from this, not me. So you have to pick your poison. Good idea. I like that. So you have two assignments to deliver. Just pick one of the two for presentation. So we're not dealing with all the other, other stuff around it. And I'm assuming all the material of all will be available to all of them? Yeah. Their homeworks? No, it won't be. Like, then you'll have to upload it on Google Drive or something. Yeah, yeah, I mean, look, it's a collective learning. And it's only two pages, which means if you have four groups, It'll take you like 30 minutes to catch up with everybody else's thinking. Yeah? OK, good. So do both, page and a half. If you do one page, I don't care. There's no page limitation. Not more than two. Uh, and you can choose PowerPoint or whatever you want to choose. In fact, you can just come on camera and just talk about it. That's fine, too, as long as you can be articulate so people can understand you. Present one, but do both. We good? OK. So that's out of the way. So what's the final number of members in a group? Um, yes. That's another question I have. Is four OK? I think five is too much. You're the one who asked for five, and I was saying four is enough. So if you have two and three, then merge. And then you have to present the PowerPoint. <laughs> just joking. No, no, I'm just joking. Yeah, four to five. Pick, pick your thing. Which means, what? <laughs> no, we're not going to make it more complicated than that. That's it. That's it. Uh, you can pick four or five. Choose your uh, partnerships. Do both. Present one next Friday. Yes, you have to f agree on a few things. This is your first test in, uh, in test. And, uh, OK. So we have about 18 minutes. And I want to leave this open for one, feedback. Did it make sense? You will never get this 12 hours back for your life. Uh, any feedback for me? Any questions for me? Anything that you want to communicate? Uh, including the Gen Zs, the critique is, is completely acceptable from both of you. But uh, I'm, again, let's leave this 18 minutes to just have a conversation. And I don't want to keep going through PowerPoint and PowerPoint. We have enough of that.
Yeah, no, it's a loaded question. Uh, let me address a few things. You're absolutely right. The existing financial market infrastructure is enormously complicated and laden with terminology and verbiage, which no one understands. And that's why banking is boring and no one wants to do it. Um, and I see a hope with NFT marketplace to simplify those elements. So I mentioned this yesterday, nobody wants to bank, but we all have our sports and music and whatever we love, and we want to take that. And financialization of those NFTs leading one way to invest in asset classes that traditionally have not been easily done. So ability for you, me to invest in a Picasso is not because it's way above my range of investment element for investing in art, but I do like to go into masterworks and buy a small piece for $1,000, for example. So I, I see a lot of hope in that. Second thing is this normal distinction between <coughs> securities, derivatives, options, uh, different asset classes the industry sees it. Cryptocurrencies in many cases obliterates that whole element because now you just own a token. And you're dealing with, again, whether it's using it as a payment instrument, using it as investment instruments, or using it as purely in keeping in your wallet and see the value that goes up and selling it when it's opportune moment, regardless of, so if you look at Coinbase, CoinDCS, in any of those entities, they are collapsed markets that today if you do derivatives or commodities, or you have to go to different markets. Right now, if you look at any of the exchanges, they are trading a cryptocurrency, they're trading a security token, they're trading, which is a legal issue for them later on, but it's a single market for you to go and deal, exchange, sell, buy, and do all these things. To me, it's, it's one of the appeal of the crypto market infrastructure that obliterates these swim lanes and different distinctions and simply deals with buying and selling and participating in that ecosystem. Which means that if you don't have money, it's another avenue for this, you can go and earn that in other avenues. Like Bitcoin, you can take your talent, earn Ether, and bring Ether to this ecosystem and do what, what you want to do with it. So I think it has a very, very positive uptake from that perspective, which we have seen again in massive in Vietnam and other countries where surprisingly India has only viewed it, at least my research and watch chain analysis done, purely as an investment alternative as opposed to a ability for us to monetize our talents. And Philippines and Vietnam has done a much better job uh, only because of the need. We are better off than them as, and, and the West has done the piss poor job except talking big and raising money, the West has done nothing, I think. Does that make sense? So I think it's just need driven. And we were hungry back in the day, I think we're less hungry now. Uh, in, in dot com and Y2K era, we were hungrier as uh, Indian generation, but I think we've uplifted ourselves from that whole element. Pakistan, believe it or not, is pretty big on these things. It's not a question of payments, it's a question of we are just fat and happy. We have a grown middle class. I mean, I, I think Indians are not what it was 30 years back. So is Americans and so is Canadians. And they just want to get rich. That's the point. But if you look at Pakistan's ecosystem, for a country that's small and with the, all the constraints they have, which we don't, we have an amazing education system, much more open governance, much more democratic systems, you find much more attractive crypto companies coming from that. We have our, like I would expect 100x of what Pakistan is churning out, and I don't see that. I'm not mentioning Pakistan because of animosity we have, but in general, because there's a need for it.